Good morning. Good morning. And welcome, welcome to Alliston Christian Reformed Church. What a beautiful day God has made. And today we will worship Him with all that we have and trust that as we do, He is with us to bless, to heal, to bring renewal. A uh, special welcome to those of you who are visiting this morning. Uh, I look around and um, there's lots of uh, boys, grade four to grade eight, and I'm so thankful that you are here to help and to lead. Uh, for those who don't know, today is Cadet Sunday, so we'll be hearing a bit from, uh, at various times in the service, from, from a few of the cadets and their counselors. Uh, and so may God bless you and your families today. I also want to welcome those who are uh, tuning in online at home. Uh, may God bless you wherever you are today. So we'll be celebrating uh, cadets this week and uh, reflecting on their theme verse, which comes from um, Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, but we also have some things to look forward to with respect to the GEMS, uh, our girls program. So I'd like to invite Karen Ford now to, to share an announcement about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's on, yeah. Oh, it might be off to turn it on. It's okay. It's good. No, don't hit no. okay. Is it working? Oh. There we go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good morning. Uh, just a few minutes, just a reminder that we have our dessert competition on um, this Friday. And if you are going to be entering and you know what you're going to be entering, there is a sign-up sheet downstairs um, in front of the bulletin board, by like in the coffee line there. If you just write your name and what you're going to make, a little bit of a description so we know what uh, category um, to put it in, and um, also if anybody has any questions about it, you can just ask me after church, and it's not just for women. Men can enter as well. A lot of our judges are men. They like to eat it, but you may also, uh, you may also uh, enter. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I participated as a judge last year for the dessert uh, fundraiser, and it was a blast. Uh, probably had to come down from a sugar high afterwards, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, do come out. It's it's such a fun event, and um, uh, yeah, I was blown away by how much life was in the room last year. So look forward to seeing people on Friday night. Brothers and sisters, please stand. Today we're reflecting uh, on Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, which is the theme verse for cadets this year. Uh, reflecting on the God who can do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. And to help us prepare our hearts to worship and to engage with God, I'd like to read a few verses from Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we extol you. We lift high your name, for you are a great and mighty God, so full of compassion and love, and you can do immeasurably more than all we can ask for or imagine. Lord, in this service today, we ask that you would be present in a powerful way to touch hearts, to change minds, to lead us into life. So we pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd move amongst us now to bless and to lift up our hearts to you, O Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is here. Receive his greeting for you this morning. 
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. As God has welcomed us, uh, take a moment to welcome one another to church today.
These are our cadets. We have a litany for us here. This year's cadet theme is rooted and grounded, based on Ephesians 3, 17 through 18. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. We as cadets are committed to being rooted and grounded in our faith in God. In the following litany, we will look at our foundation in Christ and the extent of his love for us. We need to have Christ as our basis for living. Good roots will allow us to grow strong and prosper. Fruit in season, and whose 
sleep does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. We need to allow the love of Christ to become our foundation. Trusting in God's love will give us strength. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cries out for you. God's love is wide enough to cover everyone in the world. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. God's love is so long it has no beginning or end. The extent of God's love has no limit. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. No matter how we may feel, God is still there with us. When I go up to the heavens, you are there. When I make my bed in the depths, you are there. As our theme verse was Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, may it also be our prayers for the cadets. I invite you to stand. We're going to rededicate our lives to Christ with this next song, the cadet theme song, Living for Jesus. Good morning. So my name is Councillor Munts. I'm one of the counselors for our Alston Cadet Group. Uh, I'm here to give a little update on what the cadets have been up to this year. 
Uh, Councillor Mike has already given you some of the intel, I think, earlier this year, so if I'm repeating myself or you've heard it before, well, you're going to hear it again. Uh, this year we're starting with, uh, we've got a group of about 25 cadets, a lot of newcomers, um, pretty much double the numbers we had last year, which is really exciting. Um, with so many new cadets, you need more helping hands, so we've added two counselors as well. So there's uh, our head counselor, uh, Mike, there's counselor Tim Van Ryn, Mike Beisheisen, myself, and then uh, counselor Mark Molinar and Scott Strigwerda. We're very happy to have them on board to help us out. Um, also happy to report that uh, we've made sure that uh, we're up to date. All of our counselors has got, have gone through the certification program this year, um, so they're certified. This year in cadets, we've been working on a number of different things uh, with the boys. Uh, badge work includes things like archery, woodworking, knots and lashing. We've also had a number of badges that we've been working on um, where we learn more about God and how he's at work in this world. So some of those badges include the giving badge, new life, and the Noah's Ark badge. We had winter sports day again this year. And once again, we were the champs. The trophy says otherwise if you look downstairs because it was lost for about 50 years and just returned to us. So if you're wondering, yes, we did win all those years in between, okay? So um, cadets had a great time fire building, doing axemanship, uh, compass reading, and all sorts of different activities. Uh, looking ahead, we're looking forward to having our cadetorama. That's uh, the first Saturday in May. And then we're also looking forward uh, down the road to camping, which is usually uh, in September after the first, uh, I think the second or third weekend. Now, this year at Cadets, there was one voice that was conspicuously absent. After muttering about retirement for a very long time, he suddenly just didn't show up when we got started. I think we all know who that is. So this morning, I want to take a little bit of time to uh, shed the spotlight on Councillor Jack, which I know he loves. We had some debate about how long Councillor Jack has been a counselor for our cadet group. We settled on something like 40 years or eternity, one or the other. So I'd like to invite Councillor Jack to come on up to the front. So Jack, I'm not sure if I have this correct, but I think you started in something like 1981, that's my guess. Uh, too old to remember, but 81 or 82. 81 or 82, okay. Awesome. Um, so what I'd like to do this morning, because Councillor Jack, he's been a counselor for over 40 years, he's also been in our cadet program, so he's been all over cadets for a very long time. If I could get everybody who's had Councillor Jack as either a counselor or a fellow cadet, or maybe you were his counselor, if you could stand up for a minute. Okay, that's a lot of people. Awesome. You can sit down. Thanks, guys. So, no, you're staying here. <laughs> So we were looking for a gift that we could give you, Councillor Jack, and we know you're very outdoorsy. So um, we did the best we could, and on behalf of the cadets, we wanted to present you with this uh, paddle as a recognition of your years of service to the cadet program. So thank you very much. Thank you. Now, on the back of the paddle, there are signatures from people who have either been in cadets with you or those who have been counselors with you uh, or those you've, uh, you've had the privilege to be a counselor for. Um, so I'm going to ask you not to keep it just yet. What I want to do is put the paddle downstairs. And if you have been in cadets with Counselor Jack and have not had an opportunity, uh, after the service, if you could go down and you could sign the back of that paddle for him, we'd be uh, very appreciative. So once again, another round of applause for Councillor Jack. Thank you, Councillor Jack. Uh, 
Uh, thanks for the, the applause or appreciation. It was actually uh, it was something God laid on my heart many years ago, and uh, to God be the glory. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Munts and the cadets for leading us in the litany, and uh, wonderful to have that presentation for Jack today, too. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite all the children in, forward in our congregation, children age three up to grade five, are welcome to come to the front. We will pray for you and then send you on down to Sunday school. Come on and have a seat. Wow. Have a seat, have a seat. It is so good to see you, um, and we want to pray with you as you go down to Sunday school that God would bless you and uh, give you wisdom into who he is and all that he has done. So let's pray. Lord God, we give thanks for each and every one of these children and their families. Lord, today, as they learn about you with their teacher, we pray that you'd bless them and keep them and make your face shine upon them. And may they catch a glimpse, Lord, of your love, which surpasses understanding. I pray that you'd also be with their teachers as they seek to lead and share the story. Uh, bless them all now, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed for Sunday school. Look at the mob. It's a mob. Our, th our theme in verse. It's from Ephesians chapter 3. It won't be on this, well, it'll be on the screen later, but if you'd uh, like to follow along, it's Ephesians 3. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear cadets, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesians chapter 3 is rich and exuberant. If Paul were handing in this prayer to be graded by his teacher, the teacher would give him an A plus for his good use of expressive words. Riches, glory, power, how high, how wide, how long, how deep is the love of Christ. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. What a prayer. That's the first thing I want us to know about Paul's exuberant words here. These expressive words are his prayer for the church. Paul will have lots of other words for the church in this letter, instruction, encouragement, correction, etc. But at the center sits this prayer that represents Paul's God-sized hopes for God's holy people. I'd like to point out four things about Paul's prayer today, and conveniently, all four of these points start with the letter P. I would like to say that I was smart enough to come up with this myself, but I must credit my New Testament teacher, Jeff Wyma, for this excellent outline. Before diving into the four P's of Paul's prayer, I have a question, though. Why pray? Why pray? I must confess that sometimes I feel like prayer is not always a good use of my time. I know I'm not supposed to say that, but sometimes I feel that, especially when I'm dealing with 
deadlines and time crunches and a big stack of work. Who has time for prayer when there's so much that needs to be done? But you know, the longer I go on in pastoral ministry, the more I realize that what the psalmist says is very, very true. That unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. Hudson Taylor was a British missionary who served in China in the 19th century, and he had this to say about prayer. It might be a little bit simple, but I think it expresses something very true. When we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. And who do you want working at the end of the day? Our work is not unimportant. God calls and commissions us for ministry, and he wants us to use our minds and our hands and our hearts, our everything. But you know what? No amount of preaching can bring revival. If the Valley of Dry Bones is going to live, it will not be because of my well-crafted, sometimes, sermons. It will be because of God's Holy Spirit. Me working is good, but God working is better. And so, we pray. We pray. And the first thing I'd like us to notice about Paul's prayer is the passion. The passion. It begins like this. Verse 14, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Paul's passion for the church comes out in his rich, uh, ex expressive words, but it also comes out in his posture. I kneel before the Father. In the Old Testament, the primary prayer posture was, was standing, hands raised up to God. But occasionally when the one praying was particularly desperate or discussing something of grave importance, they would drop to their knees. Jesus dropped to his knees while praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And sometimes we do this too, right? If we're feeling something so extremely in our heart, our mind, and we just want to lay it before God. We get on our knees and we pray. Paul's on his knees for the church. He's passionate about them. He wants them to be filled up to the fullness of the measure of God. Cadets, I'm guessing that sometimes your parents get on their knees to pray for you. And you might have even driven your counselors to their knees on occasion. And congregation, what if every night all of us were to get on our knees for the next generation? Our cadets, our gems, this is not an easy time to be a young person. We need to pray. Passion. Let's get on our knees to pray. The first thing we need to notice is the passion. But there's more in this prayer than just passion. There are these petitions. And this is the second point. The second P, the petitions. And the first is this, verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Essentially, this first petition is a prayer for inner renewal. Paul's desire is that the church would be alive in the spirit, filled with power, and that Jesus would dwell in their hearts through faith. You know, there is a big difference between the person who is going through the motions and the person whose heart is in it. There's a big difference between the hockey player who is in it for the money and the hockey player who is in it for the love of the game. The one is playing like their life depended on it. The other is counting down the days until their contract is fulfilled. Who do you want on your team? Nothing good happens in the church when duty replaces the vitality that only the Holy Spirit can bring. Paul's prayer is that the Spirit would strengthen their interior life and that Jesus himself would dwell in their hearts. 
The Greek word here translated dwell is a, is a strong word. It means to move on in and to inhabit. When you have guests come to your home, you say, make yourself at home. But you don't actually mean that. You want them to be comfortable, yes, but you don't want them to get so comfortable that they don't leave. I had a friend in university who didn't get the hint, didn't know when it was time to leave. I would stand by the door, he would stay. I would brush my teeth, still, talk, 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 talk. I'd get in my PJs, he'd still be there. He just kept making himself at home. Finally, one day, I just turned off the light. It's time to go. And sometimes, maybe we're a little bit like that with Jesus. We like when he comes. We like when he, come, we like when he comes over, and it's nice to have him close by, especially when we're in a jam. But we're a little hesitant to have him move in and take up permanent residence in our hearts. But if you think about it, what could be possibly better than having Christ himself at the very center of our lives? No one loves like him. No one comforts like him. No one forgives like him. No one is a better guide than him. No one is a better friend than him. No one is a better Lord than him. If you remain in me, he says, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do, do nothing. And so one of the things we need to do as we, as we get on our knees for the next generation is pray for inner renewal, that Christ would be at the center and dwell in our hearts through faith. That's Paul's first petition. And the second is connected to it, verse 18. And this is the theme verse for the cadets. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul prays that Christ would move in, and he wants the church to be grounded in and to grasp something that's ungraspable and unknowable, this profound bigness of the love of God in Christ. Cadets, I like trees. I like trees a lot, and the trees I see that seem to be doing the best are the ones that are well-rooted. They're in good soil. They are close to a reliable source of water. Trees like this, their roots go down deep, their trunks go up long, their canopy is big and beautiful. When the storm hits a tree like this, a few branches might go missing, but the tree itself is going to remain secure. And when the drought comes, if it comes, the roots will go down all the deeper. Christ's love, says Paul, is this, it's the best possible place to, to root, to root in, to ground your life. It's this inexhaustible resource. It's, it's wider than the Pacific. It's, it's higher than Everest. It's longer than the Nile. It's deeper than the deepest ocean cavern. May you grasp it, says Paul. May you be filled up to the brim with it. It's almost like Paul is like, looking over this mountain vista and seeing all of creation. It's like, I, it's so unknowable, it's so ungraspable, but could you get a taste? Could you be filled up and filled and run over with the love of God that is in Christ? This is a place to build your life, be rooted and grounded in it. We saw Christ, uh, the width and height and length and depth of Christ's love at Easter. Most of us wouldn't willingly choose to suffer for our enemies. And yet there Christ was on the cross forgiving those who are putting him to death. There is no greater love than this. I once had the privilege of knowing a young man who was going through a process of 
inner renewal in his own life, and he felt compelled to take inventory and to make a formal, exhaustive confession of sin. And he asked me if he could do that with me, and I happily agreed. So we met three times, and each time he shared an hour's worth of sins. He had them all written down in this notebook. And after each session, I had the special privilege of sharing the good news of God's inexhaustible love in Christ. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. There is no sin that Jesus can't and won't forgive. There is no impurity that the baptismal waters can't wash away. There is no suffering he can't redeem. There is no future outside of the one he is preparing for us. If you've been around the church for some time, you'll probably know something of God's love in Christ. You probably hear it maybe week after week or at least hopefully occasionally. But are we rooted in it? And are we grasping how big it is? Words only go so far in pointing people towards it. And in the end, we just have to get down on our knees and pray that people could get a taste and grasp Christ's love for them. So that is our prayer. And that's Paul's prayer for the church and our prayer for the cadets. And the third and fourth P's in Paul's prayer is the power and the praise. Verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Immeasurably more. So extreme. Immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. Jesus' disciples thought that there was no way that they could ever feed the large crowd that had gathered to hear Jesus preach. 5,000 sat there waiting and hungry, and Jesus looked at his disciples and said, you feed them. If I were there, I would have seconded Philip's statement. Philip said, Lord, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to just have a bite. But then Jesus did something that was immeasurably more than the disciples could ever ask for or imagine. He took a bit of bread and fish, he blessed it, he broke it, he multiplied it, and he fed the entire group with lots of leftovers. Now to him who can do immeasurably more, the power. And think about Easter Sunday. None of the disciples were praying for resurrection on Easter Sunday. And why would they? We all have enough sense to refrain from praying for a miracle at a funeral. But then God, through his power, did something immeasurably more than we could ever ask for or imagine. He raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We live in a strange and difficult world, and sometimes it's hard to keep our expectations of what can, God can do high. Most of us, over time, through the hard knocks of life, temper our expectations. But what might change in our way of living if we took to heart God's uh, knowledge of God's immeasurable power? What prayers might we pray? What risks might we take? I wonder how we would be and how would we, we'd be changed if, Every morning when we got up, the first thing we said to ourselves as we looked in the mirror was part of Paul's prayer. What if we said to ourselves, I am loved more than I can grasp, and God can do immeasurably more than all I could ever ask for or imagine. I am loved more than I can grasp, and God can do immeasurably more than all I could ever ask for or imagine. What might change in us if we were grounded, rooted and grounded in the power of God? And the crazy thing, according to Paul, is that this power is at work within us. 
It's not just what God can do, but what God can do through us. I mentioned Hudson Taylor at the beginning of the sermon. I was reading a bit about him this week. Hudson Taylor uh, was a British missionary. Uh, he started um, a very long-term mission in, in China in the, in the 19th century. In his first trip into the interior of China, he was robbed of every possession he owned and all his medical supplies were burned in a fire. Welcome to the mission field. But on that trip, a fire was also lit in his belly, and so he started organizing and mobilizing missionaries. And in time, over 800 missionaries followed Taylor to China. Together, they started 125 schools, medical hospitals, and through God's power, nearly 20,000 people came to Christ in faith. Taylor learned to preach in multiple dialects within China over his 54 years there, and even made a rough translation of the New Testament into a few of those dialects. I wonder what he thought would happen after his first very unsuccessful tour through inland China. I bet he couldn't imagine 800 missionaries and 20,000 converts. Here's another Taylor quote. God isn't looking for men of great faith. He's looking for common men who trust his great faithfulness. And I don't know about you, but I wish to have my imagination expanded to be able to grasp something of this immeasurably more. And I can't think my way to it. And so I have to get on my knees and pray. And at the end of the day, this isn't for the glory of Hudson Taylor, or the glory of Pastor Dave, or the glory of Counselor Jack. It's for the glory of God. And so we end in praise to God be the glory. Dear cadets, dear congregation, this is Paul's prayer for the church. This is, this is our prayer for you. May God help you to ponder anew what the Almighty can do. May your inner life be filled up. May Christ dwell there and overflow. I love looking out my kitchen window to see the cadets playing soccer and starting fires and shooting bow and arrows, to see them swinging axes and occasionally fighting in the snow. You know, you are having such fun. Keep at it. Keep growing your skills, keep strengthening you, your muscles, keep sharpening your aim. But as you go about those wonderful, awesome things, keep your eye fixed on the most important thing, being rooted and grounded in a power that is so much greater than yourself, rooted and grounded in Christ himself. There is no vista granda, there is no ocean deeper than the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. To him be the glory in the church throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your love shown to us in Christ. How high, how deep, how wide, how long is that love? And Lord, we talk about it, Lord, and we must talk about it, and we've got wonderful, rich, exuberant words to talk about it, but we know, Lord, that if we're going to experience that in its fullness, it can't just come through words, but through your Spirit's power. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd strengthen us, externally, but most importantly, internally, and that you'd root us deep, deep down in this love, that we might indeed be like trees planted by the water. And we get on our knees, Lord, and we pray for our cadets and their counselors, and we ask that you touch each and every one, one of them and uh, fill them up so that they are full with your measure. May we all, Lord, grasp your love and 
touch our imaginations too, that we might begin to lean into this immeasurably more that you promise. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond by standing and singing, Yet not I, but through Christ in me.
Hello again. The bulletin said Rita Vanderveen. Rita is not here. Uh, still recovering from a bit of a cold this morning. As she told me she would be watching from home to make sure I did it right. Hi, Rita. So the pressure is on. Today's collection is for Christian Persecuted Rescue, uh, CPR for short. Uh, and uh, we're a group of believers with a heart for Christians who have fled their homeland, often suffering beatings for their Christian faith, and under threat of death. Some ask why we concentrate only on bringing Christians out of misery. Uh, this is the rather narrow focus of our group, but the answer is found in Galatians 6.10. Whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to our Christian brothers and sisters. They escaped Pakistan and uh, have been existing in poverty without documents in Thailand for up to 10 years. There are many families. Um, today we have the case our family with us. I would ask them to arise and, and uh, turn and wave to everyone. Yeah. Uh, on uh, this side is Rukia. Rukia has been here for just three weeks. She arrived. Uh, she is the mom of the adult children, except for uh, uh, Sheba, who's the wife of Aftab. So Aftab and Sarah and Mira are all Rukia's uh, children. Sheba is married to Aftab, and they have uh, Joshua and Priscilla. Is Priscilla out to Sunday school? Good. All right. Um, and uh, they arrived a year and a half ago, almost two years ago now, right, uh, in July. Uh, and um, so uh, mom and grandma Rukia is here. Everybody has pretty good English uh, command of the English language, except Rukia, who's still getting used to English. And uh, uh, she's... Uh, she was separated from her family for nine years. Absent today is uh, the dad and grandpa Nazir. He's, uh, he lives in Brampton at the moment, uh, and uh, Rukia's husband. Uh, is Bob Graham still here? No. Oh, yep, there he is. Uh, I lost you for most of the service there. Uh, Bob. Bob is one of the leaders of the uh, CPR group and uh, one of the driving forces behind uh, getting these uh, families out of the situation they're in. Um, and then we also have uh, with us Sue Darlington. Could you stand, Sue? Uh, Sue uh, did not get rid of the family when they walked through the door. She housed them for 10 months. When, uh, when they came over and shared her, her home with them. Um, so, uh, and they are now out on their own. They have their own place in, in Barrie. Uh, please say hello to them downstairs during coffee time. And, uh, you'll, uh, they have, as I said, pretty fair English skills and, uh, they have, an amazing story to tell. Um, if you do not already have one, the CPR uh, organization brochures are on the table out in the entrance. And uh, yes, thank you for putting the, the pictures up. This was the scene uh, three weeks ago as Rukia arrived at the airport. Uh, so let us pray. We ask, Lord, for prayer for Christian Persecuted Rescue and the work of its faithful leaders. It's a tiny group whose mission you have repeatedly blessed with meaningful results. We thank you for allowing mother and grandmother Rukia 
to rejoin her family last month after nine years in hiding because of her faith. We ask that your will be done, that soon the Harrison Peter family, the Joseph family, and others who have been hiding in Thailand for the past 10 years will be on their way to freedom here. We offer a prayer of thanks for the generous folks of this church who have been and continue to be supporters with their prayers and by sharing their wealth. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, please stand. What a wonderful service. Thank you so much, cadets, for helping out in so many different ways. We will continue to pray for you and your counselors as well. And thank you, Ken, for highlighting the uh, work of CPR and uh, the important work being done. God's been with us. And God continues uh, to pour out his love upon us. Go into this week knowing that you are deeply, deeply loved. And also go into this week knowing that God can do immeasurably more than all we can ask for or imagine. Go in the power of his blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. And we all said together, Amen.